Hello everyone, how you doing today? All right, I hope. Um, welcome to the Carnegie Center Digital Outreach. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for coming and participating in our experiments in um, distance socializing. I heard that term today, so it's not uh, social distancing, but rather a way for distance socializing for us to be able to come together online. I thought that was a much nicer term to use. But, uh, so today, we have uh, a couple guests with us. We have uh, Representative Attica Scott, and we have Mahogany uh, Mayfield with us today. Uh, this is kind of in celebration of our exhibition that's on view upstairs when the museum opens back up again. Uh, it's called Permanent Natural, which is a, uh, a group show featuring hair as a form of personal expression, as a cultural relic, and artistic medium. Uh, permanent and natural explores the diverse context in which artists have used hair to incorporate the natural malleable material uh, deeply connected to individual and community identity. So uh, thank you all for coming and I'll just go ahead and get right into uh, to uh, asking you guys some questions. I just want to learn more about you two and, and the work that you do for us in our community. So Mahogany, Mahogany Mayfield. Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, I'm really interested, I want to hear about your work with My White Creating Glow, uh, which stands for, which is short for Girls League of the West. That is correct. So I have to, now we're all distant socializing, so we all have time. Um, so I can just tell you all the long story of how Maya and I created Glow. Um, so I'm originally from Louisville, Kentucky, born and raised. I studied at the University of Louisville. Um, so around the time we created Glow, Maya and I were both studying at UofL. I remember um, I was the president of the Association of Black Students in the following year. Maya was the president. We actually had um, Representative Adelica Scott come out for events, so it's really dope to be um, interviewing with the queen. Um, but while we were studying at UofL, we were taking courses around race and gender and just contextualizing um, our experiences as black girls. And I remember I had my first studio apartment in Old Louisville, um, and Maya was over working on a project for a women and gender studies class, and it was all around girls' culture. And so while working on her project, we started talking about you know, our girlhood experiences, hairstyles, not wanting to go to school if our hair wasn't done the way that we wanted it, um, crushes that we had, outfits that we had, fears that we had. And we caught ourselves like doing dances from back in the day. And we were like, wait, we don't even, we didn't know each other as girls. So we saw then just the validity and the uniqueness of black girlhood. Um, and so Maya killed her project. Um, and both of us, I mean, we're both lovely and just, when people know us from our voices, um, though Maya is a lot more chill than me, so it's a good balance. Um, but our professor for the Women and Gender Studies course supported us um, and just saw the work that we, you know, that we had in us um, and the work that we produced in the classroom. And so there was the first ever Black Girl Movement Conference at Columbia University, um, and we got support from them, um, support from our residual money. <laughs> we went up to New York, um, and we went to the Black Girl Movement Conference, and literally there were Black women that were doing work politically, philanthropists, um, advocates, activists, um, academics, trans women, just all this celebration of black girls and black girlhood. I'm telling you, we were walking down the street in Harlem, seeing girls do double dutch. Like, it was just like a black girl magic conference, essentially. Um, so when we got back, we're like, all right, girl, what are we about to do? Like, something has to be done. Um, just, I mean, there was no way that we could just take that experience for granted. Um, and so we were both taking our courses. And so we're like, well, do we want to go the LLC route? And then we're like, well, black girlhood is not business. I mean, we handle business, but we didn't want it to be that type of project. And then uh, we were like, well, a nonprofit. I'm like, we're an undergrad girl. Who's about to write these grants? Um, so this one is when Ms. Sadiqa Reynolds was newly appointed as the first woman president of the Louisville Urban League. Um, and both of us were just, yes, definitely. It was a celebration for, you know, for black women and for our city. And so at that time, we were like, we could partner with the Louisville Urban League. Literally sent an email, drafted our proposal. We came, you know, with our receipts ready. Um, and then one of our dear sisters, Cassandra Webb, was actually working at the Urban League at the time in the youth department. So Cassandra looked over everything. Um, and 
this was all in April. The conference was in April. I say we sent the proposal the end of April after we got back. In September 12, 2016, we started Girls League of the West, um, and we are a black girl empowerment program, but really bigger than that, we're a sisterhood. Um, our, our principles are celebration, liberation, and motivation, and we are in our fourth year. Maya is wrapping up her studies at Georgia State University, so another one of our sister friends, Daphne Walker, who's really been there since the Birth of Glow is helping me facilitate. We have a book coming out. It's really just like, it's beyond us, and I think that it's just rooted in purpose and, and magic, black girl magic. Uh, Mahogany, I really love the message on the Global Urban Lady website uh, where you share with these young women that the message that you are valid, you are authentic, you are amazing, you are magical, um, and encouraging them to love who they are. And that really, to me, that really resonates with the work in this exhibition by Creative Soul Photography. Um, Karen Bethencourt, uh, one of the two photographers of Creative Soul, she was quoted saying, the lack of diversity in the media often plays into the stereotypes that these girls are not good enough or often forces the kids to have low self-esteem in their work. Uh, we hope that the viewers will see the beauty and versatility of Afro hair and we hope that the girls around the world will be inspired to love their unique differences and beauty within. Um, so I wanted to talk with you about um, what we see as either a lack of representation in the media or perhaps if, there's, if it's more common, a representation that you find unrealistic or just downright negatively affects uh, these young women's sense of self-worth. Um, when you're working with these young women, do you see either one of these two scenarios, either lack of representation or poor representations, uh, having a worse effect on the young women? Or is there a, a common theme that uh, you guys are having to keep repeatedly pushed back against over and over while working with these young women? I think that what makes Glow so special is that when we're in our space, it's very much our space. And I think that it's really like a real popular to be like in the space these days. But it really is like we're really intentional on from the aesthetic. We have our like woke tapestries up. We have our, um, you know, like whatever we can do like in the Urban League to make it as cute and just sacred as possible. But in that space, all of the facades, all of the superficial stuff, we let it go. Now, are we popping? Yes. Are we going to compliment each other on our hair and our nails? You know, are we going to do all of that? Absolutely. It's a celebration. But I love that in the quote, uh, she speaks on the versatility because that's what GLOW was founded on. GLOW is founded on the versatility of black girlhood um, and of just black girls and black women internationally. Um, and so I think that one of the problems in, with media, there's so many problems with media, especially when you take in social media, um, particularly as it relates to black women and black girls and how we are portrayed. Um, but beyond that, I think that a big problem is that it boxes us in, and I struggle with that. Like, I know that I try to socially distance away from social media um, as much as I can, but when I'm on there, it can just be really problematic. Um, and it reflects, like, mainstream media. It reflects our movies, and so it just, you know, tries to make us as this, like, one-dimensional being, but we're, like, all the things we're all the levels. So in GLOW, I mean, we have our girls who are our lip gloss gangsters and they keep their lip gloss and they're hilarious and they're witty. We have our anime girls. We have our girls that do hair. We have our girls that have relaxed hair. We have our girls that um, are doing exceptionally well in school. And we have our girls that are like, hey, I need some help in this class, right? But everyone has a seat at the table. And I think that in media, it's just, it makes us, it's just really inaccurate. I think that um, it's really complex. Like, I mean, there's the standards of like, you know, the Western standards of beauty that are there, but it's like beyond that, it's like we've always had different stuff. So even if I do have long straight hair, like that's not Western, like black folks have all textures, all lengths, all hair, like we're versatile. So I feel like it's the lack of context that 
to support what's happening in media. Because media is media, it's always been that way. But I think that when our young people and adults too, I think that when we're getting fed um, media without questioning anything, you know, I have like, I had dynamic professors and dynamic leaders in the community and adult parents that, you know, instilled like blackness in me and the vers versatility of blackness in me. So I, I do. I still have struggles. Like I'm not gonna say I'm past that, but I'm able to have context on why I may feel some type of way about my hair this day, right? But I think that when all you have is social media and all you have is scrolling or all you have is a movie, you're getting fed these messages and you don't understand why. So then you're like, wait, like I don't like my natural hair, or I only want straight hair, or I don't like sew-ins. You know, I think that can be problematic too. When we're like, oh, she wears straight hair, she ain't woke. Like, no, being woke is. There's no aesthetic for, you know, blackness. There's no aesthetic for what's woke. Like, if I could afford me some bundles, like, I would have inches too, but this is what's in my price range, so I wear my hair. Um, but I think that just a lack of context is, I think, what really um, harms us when, it, when we have to take the media as truth. Yeah, that's something that uh, I really, you know, again, going back to Karen, uh, Karen Bethencourt, the creative soul photography, she mentions, you know, part of what they started their, their uh, Black Girl Magic kind of uh, series of artworks was based on um, their studio had been set up for doing uh, fashion shoots for these children. And they talk about time after time, um, kids would initially send, their parents would send in images of their kids. Um, and with this beautiful natural hair, mm -hmm. and then by the time they came in to actually do their scheduled photo shoot, all the kids' hairs would always be straightened because they felt that that was what they needed to do to uh, to get it be accepted in the fashion industry or whatever. So that was kind of they're trying to show, you know, all types of beautiful stuff. I think that's that's um, awesome. That's wonderful. You working with that uh, with these young women in Glow too. Um, so I would like to, I was interested if, rather than just focusing on um, the bad representation or lack of it, if there's any examples that you see out there that are good examples of representation that you're able to point to, uh, share with these young women of uh, the beauty in themselves and each other and the culture in general. I think some of the positive messages that I'm able to receive are because of like, you know, my 20 something wisdom and like lived experiences. Cause it's easy for me to be like, oh my God, Meg Thee Stallion is a source of inspiration. She's definitely like great representation. Now, if I was 11 or 12 years old, you know what I mean? With that alone, seeing somebody who's like showing all of their body, which I'm here for that, like no shaming at all. But I think that there's so much magic in like coming in and just like, I want pleasure. I want to be popping. I want to get a lot of money. I want to be successful and independent and be fabulous. Like I stand and from it like she's the best but when it comes to my glow girls like I have to be really 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 intentional on what I find to be positive for them um, because it's easy for them to, like they get Meg all day right but they get Meg with again that lack of context um, so I think that for someone who like can handle the content I think that Meg is a great representation of the power of black women um, I think that Issa Rae and seeing the work that she's doing is really phenomenal of being you know shouting out the awkward black girls um, I think that um, I'm always a fan for Taraji P. Henson. She's like an auntie. I think that she does good work. And I think that seeing folks' social media live videos has been really, really nice. Um, and just seeing that kind of authentic side of folks, I think it's important to get, you know, a step into their lives. Um, I think that... I don't know, this is, I mean, it's challenging because I'm like really, I love Ari Lennox. I think that she's a great representation. Um, and so I listen to a little bit more underground music sometimes, but I think that when I see them, and even then if I'm making a playlist for Glow, I'm like, just because it's a black woman singing, it doesn't mean it's necessarily appropriate. Um, but I think that for me at my age, um, and from my experiences, I think that seeing just these raw black women tell their truths, um, talk about their relationships, talk about their relationships with self, talking about self-discovery, like it looks a lot of different ways and it sounds a lot of different ways, oh, different ways, but if you look around like, we're out here, we're not playing, and I love to see it. Like, I mean, if you have your Lizzo's, where it's like, I'm here and I'm not going nowhere, period. You know, you have your city girls and, you know, there's complexity in their messages, but I mean, everybody is talking about getting it on their own. And I think that 
I think there's value to that. I think that that's important. I think that we do need, um, again, like context and reality. I think sometimes we can get caught up. But again, that's what happens when you just get push, 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 push all these messages. But I think with the right um, discussions and the right support, we're building villages. I think all of us individually, if you're like coming up unapologetically, you know, representatives having their locks, having their, you know, bright suits. I'm referencing uh, Representative Annika Scott. But when we see women like this, you know, holding all types of power, I think, and I mean, you said representation. Like when I think on a local level, like from my mama to, you know what I mean, to just the professors I've had. I mean, there's like lit black women all like just killing it and showing up with their lips, with their hoops, with their locks, with their edges. It's a whole movement going on. Yes, uh, thank you, that is awesome. And I can't wait to see the final video so I can be taking notes and some of these artists you're mentioning for me to check out. So um, uh, one last point with you I wanna make. Um, Something else that I saw on the uh, Louisville Urban League website that really hit home for me, where you said that uh, where you are reinforcing the understanding that these girls belong in all spaces. Mm -hmm. And as a curator of a museum, that really means a lot to me. That's something I, I try working on every day to, uh, to make things open for everyone to be able to develop personal experiences with the artwork. Um, I was wondering if you could share with us any stories of um, any of the girls that you work with, how their their experiences with GLOW have, you know, kind of expanded their, um, developed more comfort or confidence in what they do, what they want to do, where they want to do it kind of thing, um, or, or an example is from your own life where you were able to reach a new level of confidently expanding your boundaries. When it comes to my glow girls, I'm really intentional on not like ever taking credit just because I think that when they come into the space, like you are whole as you are, you are amazing. Like I just let all of them know that they each have, and I don't, I don't have to let them know. Like our girls, they might be having the roughest day and going through some real stuff, but I think that we all have this really inherent confidence. And I think that it just has to be polished and it has to be a not even polished I don't like that word but it has to be affirmed and it has to be just you got to get that reminder that you have that light in you and so I mean whether we're saying like you look girl like no you literally literally shine but they do the same for me um but the time where I, I just feel like it becomes really flawed when we take different foods different lifestyles, different, um, even different styles, and we associate that with whiteness, or we associate that with something other than blackness. And I think in GLOW, so we have a, a culturally, a cultural heritage component, uh, where we have an auntie of the week, so we take a black woman in history, um, and you know, of course we love our Oprahs, we love our Madam C.J. Walkers, but we try to shed light on women who are um, less known, you know, and who have really paved the way for us, so, you know, Folks, some folks are familiar with Audre Lorde, but like our middle schoolers aren't learning about Audre Lorde. And it's like liberation was one of our principles because Audre Lorde paved the way for us to talk about liberation as a concept and what it means to be free in all of your identities. Um, and so there's that piece of it. Um, but our girls are very much, I think that we have to, I think all of us have this open openness in us but it's just a matter of that being opened up like I remember you know we might think that oh I love you know this food but if you don't try the other food you might find out that you love all the foods right um and so we had an experience of that we had a summer camp in 2018 and we had Ethiopian food for lunch and like I love to tear up some Ethiopian food especially if it's the like 9.99 buffet you get to try all the things yes um, so we had that, and our girls loved it. Us facilitators, we were like, oh, they eating all the sambusas. <laughs> um, but I think it's just important. Like, I think that when we use language like exposure, I think sometimes that can be like from a deficit lens. Like, without the GLOW program, our girls wouldn't have been able to. Um, but I think that all of us need to be exposed to, to something. You know what I mean? All of us have been exposed to things, which is why we have developed different interests or different, um, you know, tastes or whatever, different boundaries, as you said. Um, so me just having parents that always 
like we have black Jesus in the house and we're not even like a super religious family, but it was just like very much like black. And I think that that did a lot for me. And I think when you put black as the foundation, like you open the world because like we are a global people, right? Like we do all the things. And so it's never like a, let me introduce you to something new or try this. It's always like, girl, this is what you come from. Like, why would you not, why would you be closed minded when you don't come from a closed minded people, right? Like we do all the things. So just really emphasizing that we do all the things, you have potential to do all the things, you've done all the things, right? Um, and it might look different for like me as a college student, like yes, I went abroad you know, numerous times and had those experiences. And if my girls aren't having those experiences, the same you know, grit that I have missing a flight or running down, you know what I mean? Or going into a bazaar in another country and getting lost shopping, like it may not be the same experience, but you also shed those and you have those same skills. You still have those same talents. You have those abilities. It's just a matter of having the chance. So hopefully I would love to take the girls out work with out of the country and we can just fall out and eat all the good international foods and do things. Um, but until then, you know, like we have that that magic in our space and it's it's worldly. It's uh, I don't know, I think that when you center culture, like the possibilities are endless and that's what we try to do with GLOW, celebrating black girlhood culture. Because I mean, you look around, we influence everybody. Everybody's TikTok and you know what I mean, it was a black girl that, you know, set the first like viral TikTok video. So it's like, I think that they have power and I, I, we all know it, but it's just a matter of like, no, like seriously, look around the world. Like you have power, like you really are who you think you are. Okay, so last question for you. I just wanted to know if there is, if you had any role models growing up that you looked up to, someone that shared some wisdom to you or just someone that you want to give a, a shout out to while you have the opportunity. Um, I have to shout out my mama and my parents, like my daddy, that's my ride to die. I love my daddy so much. But I think that definitely shout out to my mama because she just loves me so much and she's she's just beautiful inside and out. And she's a lot more modest than me and my dad. Like we think we're cute, we're a hot mess. But my mom is just so humble and I think that it makes her, you know, just so beautiful because she is, she has her high cheekbones and she's a tall woman. And it's like, those are things that you don't really think about, but those are like powerful, like being a tall black woman, like that's powerful. She had natural hair, like back in like the late eighties, early nineties when nobody had natural hair. So she's always like, I feel like I've been able to get a lot of, um, I don't know, opportunities um, because of like I'm out and you know starting my girls groups and doing work in the community where my mom's low key, but it's like she started all this, you know what I mean? Like I'm up here and I'm like, hey, I'm famous y'all, but my mom is like the real one who taught, who instilled confidence in me, who instilled blackness in me, who instilled all the things I talk about, you know what I mean? The liberation piece, like if she wasn't, though she wasn't using that exact language like by her you know reading me stories at night you know what I mean that's teaching me freedom like when you have education you're able to be smart and maneuver through this world like that's liberation uh, by I remember Mulan came out when I was a kid and the Happy Meals were giving out the hair clip that Mulan wore and my mom was like girl you can't wear that and it crushed like I was probably like seven or eight and my feelings were hurt and I was just like oh my god but no she was right um and so just seeing you know like I'm able to see like oh I'm older now and I'm confident but it was my mom who's always held me down when I wasn't confident um and who reminded me like yes you are amazing yes you are a black girl um you know, it's funny because we bump heads now, so for her to see this shout out, it's gonna be nice. We're really close, but I always take all my like jargon that I've learned in the classroom, and she's like, girl, sit down, I taught you all of that. So it's always shout out to my mommy and my daddy, um, my grandparents, my grannies, yeah, my granny Betty and granny Jackie. Just, I don't know when I think about the woman I am from like cleaning my house, that's because Granny Jackie's house smells like straight up bleach. You know what I mean? She's a cleaning woman. And then Granny Betty, she's such a diva, and that's where I get my diva side from. Then I got my fabulous Auntie Quita, who is like the epitome of a black auntie. So I've always been around like unapologetic black women who have insecurities and have, you know what I mean, struggles and all of that, but I don't see any of that or I didn't see any of that growing up because they've always just been like the best and supportive and whole. And so for me to be able to shout them out is really an honor. Shout out to y'all, I love y'all so, so much.
Uh, Representative Attica Scott, uh, I'm so pleased having you here. It's so good seeing you here again, both uh, seeing you here in person and on canvas. Uh, for about a year ago, uh, uh, a portrait that Sandra Charles had done of you in a show here. So it's good seeing you back. Um, you are literally the epitome of the young women that Mahogany works with, who they should be looking up to. Um, you've earned your bachelor's degree in political science from Knoxville College and a graduate degree from University of Tennessee. And in 2016, you were elected to serve in the Kentucky House of Representatives for the 41st District. Um, continuing on these, these positive, uh, inspirational messages that we're sharing here, I was wondering if you could share with us some of your favorite successes in your life. Um, in particular, were there any, some of your biggest obstacles that you had and that you faced and that you just crushed? So I want to start with um, saying thank you for the opportunity to be here today and um, to share this platform with Mahogany. Oh my gosh, this is awesome. And I also want folks to know that uh, we're being responsible, as you've heard, but I just want to reiterate that because I know that's going to be important to people, but we are being responsible. We're wiping down the mics before we... Um, exchange them with one another. I got my wife sitting in front of me and we're six feet apart. So just want to reiterate that so folks know that um, we're taking all the precautions. Um, I feel like there's a lot that I have definitely had to um, battle through to get to where I am today. Just growing up the way that I did, um, you know, living in the Beach Terrace housing projects and then in Los Angeles, living with my mom who struggled with both alcohol addiction and addiction to drugs and I've shared that publicly um, on many occasions but I wasn't able to do that for a long time because I felt like I would be judged and that there weren't people who um, cared enough about the struggles that black people have had with addiction to take those stories and use them to um, improve all of our lives so I didn't share for a long time until I was serving on Louisville Metro Council and uh, the Parkland Boys and Girls Club is in my district and I went there and was talking to some girls who had had some serious, uh, similar experiences and then I opened up about mine. And it just made a difference. I saw the shift, the change in their whole body and their faces when they were like, oh, this is someone who's experienced some of what I've experienced as well. So sharing my stories helped to get me where I am today. Um, and I don't know that I would say that I've overcome those childhood experiences, the childhood trauma, but I have used it to help me be who I am, to help me be a better person, a better legislator, someone who cares about kids and families who are struggling through addiction, people who are incarcerated because of addiction. Just It's helped me to be more mindful about those kinds of issues. I would also say um, serving in office, being a uh, Louisville Metro Council person, and um, you know, at the time I was in my 30s when I was elected, so I was one of the youngest at the time that I was elected. And so, being in that kind of environment um, where someone like me, who was a renter, um, there weren't other council members who were in that similar situation as me. And I remember a reporter making a comment about that oh, is you know, Councilwoman Scott the only renter on the council? And it's like, well, you know, let's not make that. Um, an issue, let's make the issue being um, affordable housing and making sure that folks have affordable and stable housing. Let's address homelessness. And then being the only black woman in the entire legislature in Kentucky has definitely been um, one of the biggest obstacles that I've had to face and I haven't done it alone. When I was first elected and I was um, first sworn in, I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be up here by myself. But then I got all kind of folks back home, people like Mahogany and other young black women and, and um, people across the district that I represent, the city of Louisville and across Kentucky, who have just showered me with so much love and support, helps me to keep going. And I get that question often, how do you keep going? How do you go back to that environment, especially for people who actually come there and, and see it for themselves, ask me, how do you do it? I, and they say they couldn't do it, but they could. When you have um, your your, um, for lack of a better word, army of support, when you, your base, your foundation of support, and you know that 
Um, there are people who are not only counting on you, but they're going to be there for you. For me, that makes it possible for me to keep showing up, even as I did in the middle of a global pandemic. I showed up because I knew one thing that I would be the possibly the only um, black legislator from Louisville who could show up because I was the only one who wasn't at higher risk. And I also knew that I needed to show up because there were some things that I needed to sh say about issues like taking away people's right to vote because of voter ID laws that other people might not be able to say. So I overcome because I have a strong um, faith upbringing and foundation that keeps me going. I keep um, overcoming because I have young people that, and, and other people, really elders, who I'm responsible to and um, who love and support me and the, the feeling is mutual. Yeah, so yeah, if there is anybody that embodies the ideal that they belong in all spaces, it's you. Uh, when you were elected to the House of Representatives, you were the first African-American woman to serve in the Kentucky General Assembly since 2000. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you did in your life prior to being elected official and how that may have prepared you for your run for office? I have to start out by giving a shout out to the first black woman who served in the legislature, Senator Georgia Davis Powers, who paved the way for all of the black women who came after me, um, which wasn't a whole lot, um, and, and for me to be able to serve. And then for um, the handful of black women who served in the House over um, 40 decades, including the last black woman before I served, the Honorable Eleanor Jordan, who has been a political mentor to me, um, who I deeply appreciate for her ability to uh, serve in a space where uh, she wasn't always welcome and wasn't always wanted there. So I, I appreciate her for uh, making it possible for me to be in this position that I'm in right now. And I know that representation does indeed matter. It makes a difference. Um, who is serving in office? Because I, I can at least speak from my experience as a black woman. I'm talking about issues that folks aren't talking about in Frankfurt. Black maternal health, um, banning discrimination against natural hair. And I'm talking about teaching African American and Native Indian history in our middle and public high schools in a way that predates slavery and is post the civil rights movement and predates colonization and is post-colonization, teaching it in a way that looks at us as full, whole human beings. Um, that makes a difference. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons why I, I keep going back and, and um, why I appreciate the women who served before I served. And I also know that that means I have a responsibility to support other black women, and quite honestly, other women of color serving um, because I shouldn't be the only one. That is not okay. It shouldn't be acceptable by anyone across Kentucky. So I was honored to put on my sneakers and go knock on doors in 2018 to help the first ever immigrant woman to serve in our legislature, Representative Nima Kulkarni. And every chance that I get, I say to other um, black women, run for office. Other women of color, run for office. You are needed. Your voice is important. Your message is powerful. You embody everything that you want to see in this world, so be that in local and state and federal office. Thank you. Yes, that is absolutely needed. Uh, appreciate that, that message. Um, while I was working on putting this exhibition together, uh, I've heard about a house bill that you introduced, House Bill 33. And it really stood out to me, given the things that I was researching at the time for this show relating to many of the artwork, artists' works in this exhibition. Um, and so I really wanted to make sure that more people got to know about your work and uh, about this bill in particular. So I was hoping that you could tell us a little more about uh, House Bill 33 and what led to, to uh, uh, your, proposing, your proposal for it. I filed House Bill 33 almost a year ago, 2019, actually at the request of constituents. Some members of Kentuckians for the Commonwealth in Jefferson County saw where California had recently passed the Crown Act. And so they messaged me on social media and said, so what are we doing in Kentucky? I'm like, oh, we're not doing anything, but I got you. And so I pre-filed the bill and 
have spent you know months now, almost a year, talking about it to folks across Kentucky, explaining how important it is for people with natural hair to be able to exist without being discriminated against because of our hair. I also have a personal connection. When my daughter was in high school, her sophomore year, the dress code policy had changed to include a hair policy that banned natural hair. And she came home from school and said, Mom, this is my hair that they're talking about. I feel personally attacked. So House Bill 33 protects people with natural hair from discrimination in employment. People should be able to work and not fear that their hair is gonna get them fired or it's gonna get them harassed. And I've talked to black women who have experienced that harassment, who have quit their jobs because they couldn't take it. And that is unacceptable, that's not okay. House Bill 33 protects people in public accommodations. You should be able to get housing without your hair being a barrier. And it protects our students who are in school because they wanna get their education. We want them to get their education and so I don't want their hair, and their hair is not a barrier. I don't want the way that people look at them because of their hair to be a barrier. I want to be really clear about that. It is not you. It is not your hair. It's other people who have their own issues that they need to deal with. It's institutional and systemic racism that we have to break down. And House Bill, 130, House Bill 33 is one of those ways that we can address that. I also want to say while I have the mic that I would love for the Glow Girls to come visit me um, in Frankfurt because since I got there um, in 2017, one of the things that I've done is make sure that I went back home and said to young people who don't ever get the opportunity to go to the people's house, their state house, their house of government, that you're welcome there. And so come see me, come visit, see what it's really like every single day to be up there because you should feel comfortable there and you should be able to see yourself sitting in these seats. Yeah, and so I follow you on Twitter, and uh, Attica's Twitter account is at Attica Scott or KY. So go follow her as well. But uh, when that happens, when the Glow Girls come visit you, I want to see some pictures on Twitter uh, of you guys together. Um, so something I remember reading that you tweeted out uh, a while back, you, know, you said that despite going an entire season in 2018 without any black state representative bills being heard, only one in 2019 and one so far in 2020, yeah, 2020, I have still made it my business to repeatedly ask the chairman to hear the bill. And I think that's really a telling statement, sadly, uh, of, of things. And it shows that it's not just enough to be able to be within a space but it still takes so much more work in order to be seen and heard and actively affecting the culture happening. So I was wondering, hoping you could share with us um, any advice that you can give to others is for not only being within these spaces, but to make sure that they're being seen and heard while they're in the spaces as well. So there are some realities that I face as the only black woman in Frankfurt. And one of those is knowing that I'm part of a legislative body where the majority refuses to hear any bills where I'm the primary sponsor. It's unfortunate, and it's a reality that we have the ability to change across Kentucky by electing different people in office, right? And that means you gotta run if you wanna see different people in office. I also know that, and this is my way of, of sharing with you, if you wanna get something done, here are some ways in which you can do it. My background before I came to serving in local or state government was in community activism and organizing. I was coordinator of Kentucky Jobs with Justice, worked with labor unions, um, immigrant worker justice, health care for everybody, voter um, restoration and voting rights, restoring people to vote, all those different issues. And I brought that organizing experience to my position in Frankfurt. That's why I do a lot of um, educating of folks about issues and how they can be activists. So what I have done with House Bill 33 is, um, and that's the bill to ban discrimination based on natural hair, is I've gone all across Kentucky talking about the issue, trying to educate folks as to why it's important, asking them to contact their state representative and ask their state representative to be supportive, asking people to contact the chair of the committee and saying to them, that chairperson, this is important. While your life experience as a white man may be different, 
than the experience of people who are impacted by this discrimination, it makes this discrimination no less hurtful. It makes this discrimination no less difficult for people to make ends meet because of employment discrimination, because of their hair, or to get housing, or kids who are in school who are being hurt by policies that ban their hair. That may not be your experience or your reality as a white man, but you have a responsibility as a legislator for all of Kentucky to hear this bill. So I've been going across the state having those conversations with people. I've also done my work, right? I wrote to the chair of the committee and the vice chair a letter asking that the bill be heard in committee. Followed that up with an email with the same request. Did that with many of my bills this session, and that chairperson was the only person who didn't respond. So I found him on the House floor and twice asked him face to face, please hear this bill. And then I got my colleagues involved. I said, okay, if this is how they're gonna treat the only black woman up here, I'm gonna to talk to my colleagues who are white. And I'm gonna to say to my colleagues who are white, I need your help. And you have a responsibility for people across this commonwealth who wear natural hair. You have a responsibility to also be an advocate and a voice for them. So I need you to also have a conversation with the chair of the committee. And they've done that. And as a result, the chair of the committee has said that he will hear the bill during the interim session, which is when this legislative session ends on April 15th. Um, we're not able to vote on any bills, but it will be an opportunity for people who've experienced this kind of discrimination to be heard. That's how you organize folks. You build up your base of support. You go to the folks who are your allies or claim to be your allies, and you say, this is the time when you can step up and actually show that in your actions. So I want people across Kentucky to hear that and um, to know that you have power and you have voice. It's how you choose to use it that can make a difference. OK, so I'll give you the uh, same last question I gave Mahogany. Is there any role models that you had growing up anyone sharing wisdom with you, or anyone that you want to give a, a shout out to while you have the opportunity? So I've been very fortunate to have um, lots of people in my life who um, I've been able to look to for guidance, for support, for direction, for advice. Um, the women in my family are phenomenal. They are powerhouses. They are the kind of women who, when I was growing up, would play space at four in the morning. It would be so loud. I'm like, I'm not gonna get any sleep because these women are so loud, but they were having a good time, right? That's what family was about, what friendship was about, being together, supporting one another. And they have been the people who have had my back from day one. They have been the people who showed me what it means to speak up and to stand up for others who may not feel like they can do that themselves. My mother, despite her struggles with addiction, was someone who showed me what it was like to love deeply and unconditionally. She was also someone who showed me what it means to be hurt and to ask for help when you needed it. I learned that from her. From her experience with her addiction, I learned to ask for help when I needed it because I didn't want to carry everything that she carried and have that eat me from the inside out. I believe that we all deserve to have lives where we can call on people when we need them and that we have to sit aside our egos to do that. Um, I will also say that I have some friends right now today who are older than me, who I seek advice from, and even if I don't seek advice, they tell me. Um, and I have some friends who are in my same age group who, you know, my girlfriends, um, all women of color, and they don't play, and they keep me in check, and I need that. And I also have people who are younger than me that I need in my life um, who will say to me, this is what we need. This is how you can support us. Um, this is how you can challenge people who are being demeaning toward our generation, who are saying negative things about us. You're in a position to be our advocate and our ally. So it's important to me to have people in every single um, age group who I can call on, but who can also call on me. But I have to give this shout out, um, this closing shout out to my daughter because she is one of the most amazing women that I know. She is 19 and she works full time and I'm gonna try not to tear up because every time I talk about her, I tear up because right now in this global pandemic, she's a pharmacy tech at Walgreens and she is at work making sure you, every single one of you have the medicine you need to be healthy. So I'm gonna end by saying so that she can be healthy, 
Do what you're supposed to do. Wash your hands, stay six feet away like we've been doing from one another. Avoid crowds of 50 people. Be intelligent, folks. Be intelligent because my daughter deserves the best. She deserves to live. So does yours. Thank you, Attica, for sharing that wisdom with us. And uh, I, I want to echo um, Attica and Mahogany and their sentiments and give a big shout out to all the mamas out there uh, sharing their wisdom with us. Um, and while Attica's here, I'll give this a reminder to everyone to, uh, in this time of distant socializing, to be sure to stay on top of your uh, civic responsibilities and go out and vote, please. Uh, um, Indiana's primaries have been rescheduled to Tuesday, June 2nd. Kentucky primaries have been rescheduled to Tuesday, June 23rd. And then, of course, the big dance, the general elections, will be Tuesday, November 3rd. Uh, and with that, everyone, thank you for tuning in. And please uh, stay safe and take care of yourselves.